Good morning, church. Let's stand together and worship and glorify the King of Kings. Who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves his breath? today to come all you weary come all you thirsty come to the well that never runs dry drink of the water come and thirst no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy of his goodness, fine. 
save us whoever believes in him will live forever Give him glory this morning. Would you please take a moment to welcome your neighbor here today to worship. Let's continue singing today. Jesus, you, 
Jesus be the center of my life. Jesus be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you. Good morning. All month long, the song of those lyrics is what we've been focused on, that Jesus is not only the sinner, but he's the source of our salvation. Dee is going to explain that well again this morning, give us tools to share that with a friend. Uh, As the the band goes off, let's just praise God for them and the leading us today. Thank you, guys. (laughs) Our mission is to love God, love people, and to serve all. This weekend, we celebrate those who often love God, uh, served, loved people, and served all very well by giving their life and follow the example of Jesus. Our author and creator of our faith, the the perfecter of our faith, Jesus has modeled that. Jesus himself said, um, greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their life for their friends. 
and, and we are saved by Jesus. We, we adore Jesus. He is at the center of everything because he led and gave his life. And this weekend, we come to this time, and I just want to pause for a moment to first thank God again for Jesus in our quiet moment, but also to thank God for those that went before us to gave of themselves to serve us and to lay down their life so that we could have freedom to worship Jesus today. So let's have a moment of silence and, and pay respect and honor to those that gave the ultimate sacrifice. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for Jesus. He's at the center. He's the source. He was the example of such a great sacrifice. Father, I thank you for the men and women who laid down their life so that we could have the freedom today to give glory to you and your son, Jesus. Father, be with those families that are still feeling the pain of lost loved ones. Father, be with those that have recently suffered loss of of evil this world. We, we, we thank you for those that stand in the gap often to protect the freedoms we have and are willing to risk their lives. Father, let us never forget the life that was laid down so that our sins could be not just covered over but removed so we could be in relationship with you again. And we give you glory and honor and praise for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Hey, we believe that love that Jesus showed us on the cross is, gives us hope, and that hope changes everything. It, it, it allows us to be in partner with people. Uh, one of the things I just want to celebrate again is uh, you for allowing us to love on those who have had loss in their uh, life. Continue to lift up the Bo White family and their recent loss. Bo was a great servant of our church family, was a custodian here for years. Let's give glory to God for Bo's life. What a great... Uh, he loved Jesus. He really, really loved Jesus. I celebrate that in, in Bo's life. Um, today, we're also going to celebrate a partner here locally uh, with Eden's Glory. Eden's Glory is one of the most, in a good way, he's going to use the words in just a minute, a radical mission opportunity that's right here in Bond County. And I say that in a way that they radically love people to change their life for Jesus. And they are taking people that have the heartache of human trafficking sex trafficking and giving them hospitality and love and changing lives. The, the, some of the ladies in that community uh, worship with us often and they are vibrant for Christ. Uh, Michael Laughlin is the, the president. He, he told me this morning he's the interim president. Uh, Michael, you are the, the president of the board in the sense that he stepped up and says, I will fill in the gap and serve these ladies well. And so I praise God for Michael. If you'll go ahead and come. Um, uh, him and his family live here in Bond County. They worship with us. Uh, his two boys are going to be in junior high together next year. They're invested, and Michael's doing a great job investing in this ministry that, that does miracles. And so um, as they're a partner with us, we're going to hear a report from him. And I just pray that you give him your attention and ask yourself, how can we come alongside Eden's glory even better than we are now? Uh, because uh, the battle is real. But the victories are coming because of effort uh, to, to lift these women up and, and support them. Let's praise God for Michael even as he shares now. Good morning. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is the work that these women are doing. Um, so I serve on the board um, and I help administratively, but they're doing the real work. Um, so um, the directors are Annie, who's front center, and Ginger, who's front or sorry, back left um, in that picture. Uh, next slide. Um, so the work actually started um, for Ginger and Annie back from uh, college, looking into uh, human trafficking and realizing that there's still millions of people in labor traffic and sexual exploitation throughout the world and in the US today. Um, and so they thought about what can we as Christians do to basically um, address this problem. And where they landed was focusing on Jesus and focusing on community and working together um, as a community to help serve um, survivors. Next slide. Um, so Eden's Glory is a home um, fortifying survivors, educating communities, and working to end human trafficking, all for the glory of God, and it does all of those things. So it has a home um, here nearby where survivors of human trafficking um, can go and live for a two-year program. 
Um, and then it also reaches out and tries to educate community members um, on how to recognize human trafficking and also how to step in um, and try to help rescue people from human trafficking. Next slide. Um, so the posture of Eden's glory, it begins with prayer and partnership. Um, and so it takes a radical and biblical hospitality model where we are inviting the women into the home and they are living with the staff members and with and the staff members and the directors help build community and learn together. Um, and so some of the care they get is focused on trauma, some is counseling, um, but all of it is centered around their relationship with Jesus. And the goal is basically transforming lives, um, transforming lives so that they can be successful in society, but also transforming lives so that they build a relationship with Jesus. Um, and the other thing that the staff will tell you is that while doing the work, the lives of the staff member also get transformed through the work that they are doing with these women. Next slide. Um, so one of the things that's important to realize is that trafficking is a symptom of a much deeper issue, and so oftentimes there's something that precedes human trafficking, and many people, we think about like Liam Neeson and Taken and think people are like taken into human trafficking, oftentimes they opt into it. Um, they think they're going into something that they don't realize what it is, and then they choose to stay because they feel loved, or they think they're, that's the best they can do, um, and oftentimes there's these other things that precede it, whether it's addiction or abuse, um, and so trying to treat those things is also something that's important that I'll talk about in a minute. Next slide. Um, so one of the things Eden's Glory is also doing besides supporting um, survivors already and focusing on educating is also trying to think of what else can we do. One of the realities in the U.S. still is there's not enough um, beds or not enough places for survivors to go to actually um, focus on recovery. Um, but also they've started Foster Kairos, and so that's focused on, on minors um, and kids. And so one of the more tragic things about human trafficking is most enter human trafficking while, while kids, um, usually teenagers or younger. Um, and so it's focusing on kids that have either been in human trafficking or have been exposed to abuse or addiction or something like that and helping them to basically get past that trauma. Um, Eden's Glory West Coast is another house they're working with to open a house out in California um, and start a house that's modeled after Eden's Glory to also serve survivors out there. Um, and then they're building a house on their property or hoping, planning to build a house on their property to increase the number of beds here to serve more women um, in our community. Next slide. Um, so there's a couple testimonies I want to share. So the first is from a survivor of Eden's Glory. Um, and when she arrived at Eden's Glory, she couldn't focus beyond the day, um, the present. Um, and uh, what she said was that at Eden's Glory, I was able to find freedom from the things that kept me in bondage for so long. But obtaining freedom is exhausting. It's a, it's a full-time job. Fighting for my life is one of the hardest things I have ever done. And with the help of Eden's glory, I was able to do that. They gave me the tools to fight. They gave me unconditional love. I felt that I was so undeserving of. Even on the days that weren't so pretty, I'll forever be grateful for Eden's glory and the donors that gave me opportunity of healing. They truly changed the direction that my life was headed. Um, and so for this survivor, um, she's gone on and she's taken college classes. She now has like a 10-year plan. And so her life has significantly changed because of her interaction and her growth um, at Eden's glory and then beyond. Um, next slide. Um, and so this is from a, a kid. One of the things that um, Foster Kairos focuses on is trauma. Um, and so um, oftentimes kids will get bad thoughts or they will self-blame when they've, they've been in abusive relationships. And so finding paths for the kids to think of a way to think about something else rather than thinking about hurtful things towards themselves becomes very important. And so with this kid, they use We Don't Talk About Bruno. And when they start having bad thoughts, they'd start singing that song in their head, and all of a sudden it became a joyous occasion for them instead of a bad occasion for them. Next slide. Um, so one of the more important things is, like, what can we all do? Again, it's a community-based um, model. Um, and so if nothing else, on Tuesdays at 8 a.m., they're always praying, and you can just pray at that time, too. There's part-time and full-time jobs they have openings for also. Hey, you can volunteer in the board, you can volunteer in programs, you can donate. Um, one of the biggest things I'd say, which is why I think uh, Tyler highlighted the interim part, is that um, when they asked me to be on the board, I thought, why are they asking me? I can't do this. I'm insufficient. When they asked me to be the president, I said, I'll be interim president, not president, because I am not qualified. I am not good enough. Um, and one of the biggest things I want to highlight for you all today is if you're getting pushed in a direction that feels like you're not sure why God's pushing you and you feel like maybe that's not me, um, you can do it, and the way you can do it is basically God can do it through you. And there's any, so there's, um, you can do anything through God. 
That's it. Sorry. I shortened it. <laughs> Let's take a moment and we'll lift up Michael and the entire organization of Eden's Glory. Heavenly Father, we are so very, very grateful that there are those who are willing to step out, Annie and Ginger and Michael and others, to, uh, to use their gifts and talents you've given to them to intervene in the lives of, of people who, have, who believe that, that what they're doing is the best thing they can do. It's the only possible way out. Uh, Father, it, 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 I know it breaks our hearts to know that, that an organization like Eden's Glory even needs to exist. But it does, and we're glad that it does, because there are so many hurting, so many searching, so many lost individuals. And Father, as you put Eden's glory uh, in, the, in the face of these uh, uh, folks who are dealing with being trafficked and, and, and being abused, Father, I, I pray that, that you will continue to give them the resources, the strength, the ability to do, that, to do that intercession, to speak into these lives words of hope and encouragement, value and, and purpose. Father, we lift up Eden's glory to you. I pray that your blessings will be poured out upon it and that it will continue to make a difference in the lives of folks here in our community. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Michael, thank you so much. Today we're, uh, we're bringing to a close a, uh, a series of messages that uh, Tyson has been dealing with the past several weeks on reaching out and evangelizing, sharing the gospel. After one of those sermons that Tyson gave, there was a man that said, man, we could, we could really use a, a lesson or a class on personal evangelism. Well, this is it. It's not the whole thing, but this is one of them. So we're going to be dealing with some, uh, some thoughts that help you in learning how to share the faith. So I want you to be thinking of this today about the fact that, that there's coming into your life somebody you've been talking with and working with and praying with. They are a seeker, and they, they're going to ask that question, how do I become a Christian? What do I need to do to become a, a Christian? And we're going to answer those questions as they're asked. Back in April, Denny Grant and his brother David and I went down to Bennett Springs, Missouri. Uh, Denny said, I want to take you fly fishing. And I've never been fly fishing. I didn't know anything about it. If you know fly fishing, it's you put on these big waders and a kind of a funny hat. You've got a nine-foot rod, and you cast out in the water with all kinds of bait, things called woolly boogers and uh, uh, dry flies and nymphs and uh, copperheads, all those kind of things. I had a really great time. It was a lot of fun, my first uh, time doing this. And I really thought I, I did really pretty well. I brought back some, some great catches. Uh, 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 you know, there's, that was a hard one to pull in. Uh, this, the last one was the best. Man, I tell you, that really pulled that nine-foot rod getting that thing in. Denny did a good job as well. Uh, they weren't quite the same size, but uh, you know, they were good, and they put up a fight, and Denny really struggled to bring in this last one, but he got it in. He got it in, and, and I was really proud of him. No, it wasn't that way at all. I love the fact that Jesus calls us to fish, to fish. But he's not saying, come on and fish for trout and bass and bluegill and, and, and crappie, those kind of things. In the fourth chapter of Matthew, it says, One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew. They were throwing their net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. They left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he, and he called them to come too, and they immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Now, it makes sense when Jesus called these disciples to follow him to fish for people, and the first ones that he called was Peter, Andrew, James, and John because they fished for a living. So he said, I want you to stop fishing so you can start fishing. I want you to stop throwing nets out here for fish and start throwing nets out for people. I want to teach you how to bring people into a saving relationship with God the Father. Now, Tyson's messages that we've been hearing are talking about growing out by sharing the good news of Jesus, his salvation, his love, his mercy, his grace, all those things. And today I want to give you some tools to use so that you can also be able to do this relatively easily. Uh, you've heard of the Roman road. Well, what I'm going to give you is a Roman road that you can look at in Scripture and simply go down through these texts. And as you go down through these texts in Roman, you can, you can help a person see 
how to get from point A to point B, to a point of, of asking the question, to the point of saying, why can't I be baptized into Jesus Christ? But before we open that toolbox, there are some things that you need to consider. Number one, how many non-Christian friends do you have? If the answer is zero, you're not going to be a very good fisherman because you don't have anybody to fish for. You need to have people that you know, acquaintances. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a coworker, Maybe it's a, a friend at school. It may be somebody in your family that is not a believer, and you need to have friends that aren't believers in order to be able to share the gospel with them. Number two, the person you're sharing with is not a project. Man, sometimes we get our sights fixed on somebody and say, man, I'm going I'm to pour myself into this person's life and I'm going to love him, I'm going to teach him, I'm going to let him know about Christ and they accept Jesus and, and, and they're baptized into Christ and they find a place in the pew and say, now it's on to number two. And you go out and just leave this person sitting there by themselves. Man, you need to invest in their life totally, not just for that moment when they, when they say that they love Christ and they want to become a Christian, but you need to continue to love them and pour your life into them as well. These people are not a project. They're a person. Third thing is this. We share the good news with others because somebody shared it with us once, didn't they? Somebody told us about Christ. I mean, who were we before we were Christians? Paul describes us this way in Ephesians 2. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us, all of us used to live that way. We follow the passionate desires and, and the inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject of God's anger. The NIV says that we were subject, we were objects of God's wrath, like everyone else. Have you ever been the object of anybody's ire, their anger, their wrath? Man, it's not a good feeling. God is not angry at us, but he's angry at the sin that's a part of our life. That's what he's mad about. You see, our, our, our fallen nature tends to be the target of, of God's judgment. And I do not believe that sharing the good news of Jesus will become a priority unless we recognize and accept the truth of heaven and hell, eternal life and eternal punishment. Unless we believe in those things and we're concerned about them, we're, we're terrified of hell and we look forward to heaven, unless we believe any of that, we're not going to have any inclination, any motivation to share the good news at all. The fourth thing is this. Universalism is not a biblical truth. I know people say, well, I don't believe the same way you do, and I don't go to church, I don't do all those things, but you know God is a good God, and his son Jesus loves us, and, and that's all that really matters, right? God is love, and so the end, he's going to bring everybody in. Man, that sounds so inclusive. But the idea that there are many paths to heaven causes many to loosely handle sin as well as other core doctrines of the faith all right there's a phone number up on the screen somebody take out your phone and dial that number i don't care everybody has a phone come on you can do this just dial the phone number 618-614-4002 someone call that number Now, please take that down quickly. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my phone number. Yeah, thank you. Now, it's busy. I'm sorry. I'm not taking any more calls. Uh, <clears throat> if you had called 618-614-4001, <laughs> this happened in first service, too. I'm just going to shut the thing off. That's the only way I know how to get rid of it. I hate phones. If you called 618-614-4001, my phone won't ring. If you called 618-614-4003, my phone will not ring. If you dialed any other number than the one that was up on the screen, my phone will not ring. It doesn't make any difference how sincere you are, how much you love your phone, how much you love my phone, how accurate you think AT&T or Verizon is. None of those things make any difference. The only thing that matters is you have to dial the right number. No other number will work. Jesus basically said the same thing when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to my Father except through me. He said, I am 618-614-4002. you got to dial that number. You have to believe in Jesus. Universalism isn't a biblical concept. It's a very, it's a very inclusive way, though, to come. 
Jesus said, this is how much God loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, will not be destroyed, but will have everlasting life. Everyone who accepts Christ receives that reward. Gary Johnson, who is the executive director of E2, Effective Elders, we had him here to speak a number of times, a great preacher, said, countless people are in need of Christ Countless people are in need of Christ, and Jesus is counting on countless Christians to reach those who are spiritually lost. We have been given a command, a mandate by Jesus Christ himself to go and make disciples of all nations. And that mandate will always be in effect. The question is, will we be effective in fulfilling that mandate? In your pew in front of you is a little card. I hope you saw this. Pull this out. You keep this. Put this in your Bible. And this is the Roman Road Toolbox. So this morning, imagine that here is a a young person, older person. doesn't make any difference. This person says, hey, I've been coming to church. I've been worshiping with you. I've been hearing the messages. And and I think I'm ready to take that step. I I, I would like to know what do I need to do? What, What do I have to do to become a Christian? This is a seeker. So our seeker here today is wanting some answers to some questions. So as you begin to determine the readiness of this individual, we can go down through some scriptures. And if you just remember these, even put these in there, you can refer to those and have a conversation that would go something like this. You know, before before you're baptized in Christ, before we do this, let's let's talk about the Bible a little bit. And, And I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. These are the transitional questions you see. Number one, if you were to die tonight... God forbid, but if you were, would you go to heaven? The answers vary. I think so. I hope so. I don't know. No. And I want people to be honest because I want them to wrestle with the seriousness of those answers, the seriousness of that question. That leads to a transitional question number two. If you were to die tonight and you stood before the throne of God, what reasons would you give him to allow you into his heaven? Why would you say, God, I deserve to be here? Well, the answers also vary in that. People will say, well, uh, I I went to church, you know, a few times. I put some money in the offering. I I helped a little old lady across the street. I've tried to be good. I've tried to be good. The Bible tells us, though, that being good is not good enough. Our, Our best efforts will not guarantee your salvation. No matter how hard you try, no matter how many times you come to church, no matter how much you put in the offering, all those things, they just won't won't stack up. Imagine doing it this way. Imagine you've got a piece of paper and you draw a line down the middle, and on one side I would write, these are the good things that D has done, and these are the bad things that D has done. And so I sit down and start writing up all the good things. Man, I gave mom a gift on Mother's Day, and, and I've been nice to people. I've tried to help a lot of folks. I write these things down. Uh, I've been a friend of Ben Allen because he really needs one, and I'd write that down. I, I took good care of my dog. Uh, uh, I, during, during my ministry, I helped build two church buildings. I, I'm writing these good things down but then there's the other side there's the bad side and I start writing things down there man there are times I disobeyed mom and dad yeah gotta write that down I've been accused of being a jerk and I can't deny that so I write that down there have been times I've been selfish with my time and not giving that time to my wife I know I've got to write that down I secretly fantasize about being taller than Tyson Uh, yeah I gotta write that down I may have kicked a cat when I was frustrated I don't know what side that goes on uh Sorry, all you cat lovers out there. I, I, I will repent later. Uh, it, it always comes back to bite me when I say that one. I I've taken credit in ministry for things that God has done and, and that I did not do, and certainly that should go on the bad side. Now, if you and I are honest, we know that we probably have more things written on the bad side than we do the good side. And so God asks the question, why should I let you in? Why should I let you into my heaven? And you then might say, well, God, here's my list. God, look, look at the good side. Look at all the great things I've done. And, and God said, yeah, that's really great. I'm really proud of you. But what about the other side of the paper? No, 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 wait a minute, God. Look over here again. Don't you remember when I was a Girl Scout and I sold, I sold all those thin mint cookies or, or, or I stopped and helped that guy fix his flat tire? These are really good things. God said, yeah, but look at the other side. It only takes one. It only takes one bad deed to keep you out of my heaven because heaven is a perfect place for perfected people what if we had spent all of our life all of our efforts all of our time trying to be good enough to get through those pearly gates but we missed it 
we missed the goodness mark. Now, the wonderful news is our goodness is not the measuring stick. God's goodness. That's it. That's the only thing that matters. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to live a good life. That's not what I'm saying. But the point is this. God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. His sufficient grace is greater than our insufficiencies. He has done what we cannot do. Praise God for that. So, with our seeker, we've established the fact that no one is good enough to go to heaven. So that brings us to the next question, then, well, then who needs to be saved? Paul told the church in Rome, everybody. There is no difference, for all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all done that. The word sin comes from this little Greek word, hamartia, that means to miss the mark. Imagine the, the, the archer shooting the arrow across the field, and he misses the target. He misses the field. He misses everything. God has a design. God has a plan for us. God has a way that we'd like for us to live. And when we sin, we veer off of that path. We veer off of that, uh, that design for us, and we've sinned. We've disobeyed God's law. We've, we've done the wrong thing. We failed to do what God expects. We didn't do the right thing. James says, remember, it's a sin It is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. The Bible tells us that anything that we do that isn't propelled by our righteousness, by faith, can be sin. So there's no doubt in anybody's mind we're all sinners. I ask the question, how many murders does it take to make a person a murderer? Only one. Well, how many sins does it take to make a person a sinner? Only one. Have you ever sinned? Yes. Then we need to be saved. So I ask our our, um, seeker here, well, what are the consequences of sin? Well, we go to Romans 6, 23, and Paul writes, the wages of sin is death. Wages, that's not a word that we use a whole lot. Sometimes when I'm talking with children, they don't really understand the idea of wages. Wages is your paycheck. You go to work, at the end of two weeks or one week or a month, whatever it is, you get a paycheck. That's your wage. This is what you earn, you deserve. This is the consequences of the work that you've done. When we sin, the wages of sin is death. The, the, the result of wrong choices, bad decisions. The wages of sin is death. What is death? We understand that death is when the body stops working and our body dies. But death is also described in Scripture as being separated from God spiritually. So anybody walking around that doesn't know who Jesus is, who's not committed their life to Christ, is spiritually dead. If you don't do something about that spiritual deadness while we are physically physically alive and then we die, then we are eternally dead. We are eternally separated from Jesus Christ, from God the Father. The wages of our sin, the result of our rebellion is death, physical, spiritual, and eternal. But Paul didn't stop there. He said, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, the justice of God demands punishment, but the love of God demands mercy. How do we harmonize these two realities? Paul said in Romans 5, 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die while we were still caught up in our rebellion, while we were still doing the wrong thing and not doing the right thing, while we were still disobeying God, Jesus Christ died for us. He took the punishment upon himself on the cross for us. You've seen this acrostic before. I think, I, I believe Tyson has used it before as well. God's riches at Christ's expense. What are the riches of God? This is a great thing to share with somebody you're talking to. The riches of God is heaven, eternal life, his mercy, grace, his love, his compassion, his salvation. Those are all the riches of God. How did they come to us? At the expense of Christ. What did Christ have to spend? He spent his life. He gave his life. He gave his life for us on the cross. It cost him his life for us to have eternal life. That's one really great way to show that. Write that down in the back of your card. God's riches at Christ's expense. But sometimes I like to be able to use an illustration that might be a little bit more personal. Brian Grove, he's on his way to St. Louis. He's got to get down there. He's in a hurry. He gets out on Interstate 70. The speed limit's 70 on 70. But Brian's in a hurry. He's doing 80. 
five. <laughs> he, he's, he's really in a hurry. So he's driving down the highway. Here comes one of Illinois' finest red lights. Pull him over. Mr. Grove, you were driving 85 in a 70 mile an hour speed zone. And there's a new law now that says because uh, you have been, you've been pulled over, then you have to pay the fine. It's $1,000 right now. Brian says, man, I, I don't have that kind of money. The policeman says, well, you're going to jail. Well, uh, Tyson is driving down the road, and Tyson recognizes Brian's car. Tyson pulls over and asks what's going on. Brian explains, and Tyson said, well, you know, I'm independently wealthy. So Tyson, he whips out the billfold, throws out uh, 10 big ones to the officer, and Brian goes scot-free. Now, who broke the law? You can say it. Brian, great. Who should have paid the fine? Right. Who paid the fine? Did he break the law? Was he obligated to pay the fine? Why did he do it? Because of love. Because of love. And he had the money. Yeah. Because of love. That's why Jesus did on the cross for us what we could not do for ourselves. It was that, it was that unconditional love of the Son of God that looked at us and said, there's no way that you can do enough to earn salvation. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to, exp- I'm going to span that gap between you and the Father, and I'll die on the cross, and I'll pay the price, I'll pay the penalty, I'll pay the fine that you can't pay, so that eternal life can be lived. Man, what a gift. What a gift. Has the law been satisfied? Yes. Has mercy been shown? Yes. The death of Jesus on the cross satisfied both. Now, we're talking with a seeker, and the the statement can be made that Jesus died to give us eternal life with him in heaven, and he gave us this promise as a gift. Well, what do you have to do to receive the gift? Here's a nice box all wrapped up in pretty paper with a nice bow, and I'm handing it to you, handing it to our seeker here. Say, here's a gift. What do you have to do to get it? Well, do I have to run around the house? No. Do you have to do push-ups? No. Do you have to give you money? No. What do you have to do to receive the gift? Take it? Exactly. It's a free gift. It's a gift to you. The Bible says it's by grace you have been saved through faith. It doesn't come from us. It's not from ourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not by works so that anyone can boast, for we are God's workmanship. God has created us in in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Well, so here's the gift. How do you accept it? Paul told the church in Rome to do this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. When we hear the the word confess, we think of law and order. Okay, you've got to confess to the crime. That's not what the word means here. The word confess means to speak in agreement with something that's been said. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is our great confession. That is our commitment that we make. I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. So we confess that to be true. And then we believe in our hearts, he said. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. We begin with belief. But belief must result in trust in Jesus and a changed changed life that's illustrated by repentance and baptism. How do, you, how do you illustrate a changed life? How do you illustrate an action? I believe that that seat will hold me up. And you can all say, fine, prove it. So if I go down the steps and sit on the seat, I have proven that that seat will hold me up. You see, we illustrate our belief by an action. That's what happens when we're baptized into Christ. That's not all that it means, but that's partly what it means. We're told to be baptized in Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Romans 6, 1 through 6, and uh, uh, 1 Peter 3, 21. And those are just a few of the verses we have. On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached this great sermon to the crowd. And he said, this same Jesus that you have crucified is now both Lord and God, Lord and Savior. Yet you crucified him. The people in the crowd it said they were cut to the heart. In other words, they were convicted by the message, and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, You repent and be immersed into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter didn't say, Raise your hand. He didn't say, Say this prayer. That's not what he said. He said, Repent. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 says that we are baptized into his death. The word into denotes ownership. We're baptized literally into the ownership of Christ. In Romans 6, 4, it says, Christ was raised from the dead. Our immersion is this beautiful picture of of, of dying to our sin and being raised once again. 
Down in Anna, at the church where I preached there, we had a portable baptistry. The new building we built didn't have a built-in baptistry, so we had a portable one that was both our communion table and the baptistry. We'd take the top off. It was filled with water. And when a person got into the baptistry and was baptized and came out, we had this beautiful, heavy, uh, cotton white robe that we had taken from Holiday Inn. No, no, we didn't didn't get it there. Uh, We actually bought this. And we used that to wrap the person up in this robe. And it was such a marvelous picture. This person had been baptized. They had been raised in a new life. And now they stepped outside and they're wrapped in this white, pure robe. And this picture of purity is just, was so beautifully seen. In Romans 6, 5, it says, we have died to sin. The old is gone. The new has come, Paul tells us. Now, when we get into a discussion or we were talking about baptism, there are questions that come up. And it happens to me all the time. It happens to Tyson. Anybody else that's gone through the Roman road will, will have some questions that we answer. And so we answer those. A person will ask, maybe ask a question, well, why do you, why do you people immerse instead of uh, just you know, pouring some water or sprinkling doing that? Because that's what the Bible says to do. The, the, the word baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo. The Greeks would give, a, give a, a, a word according to sometimes the sound that it made. And so when something went under the water, they would call that bap. Baptizo meant, meant to plunge, dip, pour. It's the word they use for dyeing a, a piece of cloth. And so the Bible says when a person comes to Christ, they are immersed. The word baptizo is only translated to the English word immerse. There's no other word. As a matter of fact, bap or baptize is not even, it's, it's a transliteration of the Greek word. So we do what the, the, the word says to do. Somebody will say, I was baptized as a baby. Do I need to be baptized again? If you were sprinkled as a, an infant, as a child, as a baby, that was a, a way of mom and dad dedicating you. It was a very special time for them, a, a very special time for you. But, but I want you to consider two, two points. One, infant baptism is never, is never, seen, displayed, or talked about, or taught in the Scripture. We we don't see an example of it anywhere. And number two, in the Bible, baptism is always a response to hearing and believing the Word. Immersion always follows somebody's choice, somebody's decision to surrender to Christ. A baby can't make that decision. A baby has no ability to decide by faith what they will do or not do. Somebody may ask the question, well, do I have to be baptized to be saved? You know what? That's that's a question the New Testament never asks. It just assumes that you will. It assumes that because it was taught that you will follow that and you'll be obedient to that. When when Apollos was preaching about Jesus, he only knew of of, of John's baptism for repentance. He didn't know of of Jesus' baptism. And so one day Aquila and Priscilla hear Apollos preach. And they kind of take him aside and say, hey, it was a great sermon. You did a great job. But do you not know uh, about the baptism into Jesus Christ for salvation? No, I I don't know about that. And it says in some translations, they taught him the more excellent way. And so he followed through with that. You see, baptism by itself doesn't save you. But the Bible does teach that immersion, when it's preceded by belief and by repentance and by confession, plays a critical role, an essential part in our salvation. Now, God can do whatever God wants to do. I mean, he can do that. But when we know what the Bible teaches about this, why would we not want to do what the Bible says specifically? Peter writes, this water water symbolizes baptism that, that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. The, the, The cleaning up of our mind. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's gone into heaven at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. And we submit to Christ when we're baptized into him. Somebody might ask, do you have to be immersed again to belong to Greenville First Christian Church? Well, let me ask you, were you baptized into the church? No, you were baptized into Christ. So if you've been immersed once and you understand what that means, that's all that we ask. That's all that you have to do. A.W. Tozer wrote, It is altogether doubtful whether any man can be saved who comes to Christ for his help with no intention to obey him. This past Easter, our kids and grandkids were here, and my youngest grandson, Ezra, said, said, Papa, uh, I want to be baptized. And they'll do this at some date a little bit later on when they're back in D.C. 
I said, man, that's great, Ezra. I'm, I'm so happy for you. Let's talk about that. So we sat down. I want to ask him a question or two and see if he understood things. I said, can you exegete Romans 8? He didn't do that. <clears throat> And I asked him questions, and he gave some really great answers. But the first thing I asked Ezra was, Ezra, why? Why do you want to be baptized? He said, because I love God. Yes. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. But that's not where it ends. That's not where it, that's not where it concludes. Every morning when I get up before I come to the office, I'll be eating my breakfast, and I'll open up the laptop or the computer, and I'll look at, uh, look at the obits that are there on WGEL. I want to see if my name is there. So far, it has not been. But I like to, like to read to see if there's anybody there that, that's a part of the church family or related to some, so we'll know what's going on. And, and, uh, and when I'm reading through the obits, it's always interesting to read about accomplishments and places they've gone, things they've done, what they did in life, and who they were related to. You know, all, all those facts and details about a person who's lived and a person who's died. I read one that said that this, this person, and some of these, most of these are not even from, from town. They're out of the area. I, I love spending time with his, he loved spending time with his wife and traveling and tinkering with and riding motorcycles. He, he never met a stranger and was always the first to offer a helping hand. He was a former member of the Masonic Lodge. Another obit read, he took great pride in his yard and keeping it immaculate. He loved to fish. Play darts with his children and golf every chance he got. I ran across one the other day in the St. Louis Post I, I found interesting. It said, this man was known throughout his life as a genuinely nice guy. He swam for the Missouri Athletic Club, the St. Louis University High, and, and the Navy. He also obtained his pilot's license and once landed at Lambert Field. It said that he somehow squeezed in golf time and took pride in having hit three holes in one. Cool. In each one of those obits, there is something glaringly absent. No mention of or no affiliation with any type of church. And that doesn't mean, just because it's not in print, it doesn't mean the person did not have that. But I've always found, generally, that a person who truly loved Jesus, truly committed to walking with Christ, that somewhere in that line of information, that's going to be said. I told First Service that some months ago, Guyanetta Wright met with Tyson and I and talking about her funeral service, which we hope is no time soon. But she said, this is what I want. I want you to say that Guyanetta Wright lived and died, and she loved Jesus. And the rest of the time, talk about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. When they sit down to write out our obit, what will it say? And as I speak to my seeker friend, what do you want yours to say? That you were a great golfer? You were good to your kids? You held positions in government or the school? Nothing wrong with any of those things. But when it's all said and done, what will really matter? Do you know Jesus? Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, asks the question, is our name going to be written in the Lamb's book of life? This morning, we talked about the conversation through the Roman road that you can have with a seeker. But possibly today, you're seeking and you may be one of those individuals that is now confronted with the question, what will you do with what you know? What will you do with Jesus? Will you walk out the doors and think, well, I'll have an opportunity in the future? Or will you say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I, I want him as my Lord and Savior. Let that be known. Complete that obedience and baptism. Then walk, walk a life with Christ. If you need to make that choice, please come. Tyson's here. I'm here. Be willing to take that confession of faith. The, the baptistry is ready to go. Would you stand? Heavenly Father, this morning as we contemplate not only our role and our work in sharing the good news, but Father, also the results of that, help us to be sympathetic to those that have questions, to answer as best we can. But Father, most of all, to point them to Jesus, 
not any number of things that we say to do, but, Father, mostly to point them to you, the, the author and the perfecter of our faith, the giver of our salvation, the one who's made it possible for us to spend eternity with you and your Father in heaven, not by anything that we have done, Father, but purely by what you have done through grace. And, Father, this morning, if there's someone wrestling with that very, very issue, that very position, I pray they would surrender their life to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As our eyes, strength of God, go before, lift me up. As I wake, eyes of God, look upon, be my side. As a way, heart of God, satisfy and sustain. As I hear voice of God, lead me on, be my God. Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me. Christ be all around me. As I go, hand of God, my defense. By my side, as I rest, breath of God, fall upon, bring me peace, bring me peace above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees. Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me. Christ be all around me, yeah. oh, 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 Christ be all around Be 
before and behind me in every eye that sees me Christ be all around me yeah. oh, 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 oh. Christ be all around me yeah. oh, 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 oh. Christ be all around This is Alan Lawson, and uh, he comes today. He's been a believer for a long time. He was gave his life to Jesus in his 20s, was, was immersed, and was made new and saved. And he come today um, touched by the Holy Spirit and, and convicted by the Word. And he uh, just wants to confess again and get his life back on track and reclaim uh, before the Father and before you, the church family, that he, his Savior is Jesus Christ. And we're going to allow him to take that confession again and claim the salvation through the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And we're going to celebrate with him. So, Alan, if you repeat after me. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And he's my Lord and Savior. And he's my Lord and Savior. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen, brother. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Alan and the boldness it takes to just declare that once again he claims Jesus. We say it again, he claims Jesus. He doesn't claim his, his goodness, his good works, his family. He claims the fact that he has salvation through the blood of Jesus and the good news that is for everyone here. Father, um, we thank you that he was made new in baptism and that uh, through the Holy Spirit he has been... Um, his, his, his mind and his heart have been drawn back to salvation through Jesus Christ. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Congratulations, brother. Would you please prepare your elements for communion? Uh, there's a hymn that we uh, have been singing in, in first service uh, called uh, Before the Throne of God Above. And the third verse especially in that hymn uh, speaks very strongly of the joys of eternity with Christ. It, it goes like this. It says, Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. I think this verse especially evokes the, the image of heaven, that it's not a a uh, place to sleep in forever, and it's not necessarily a place to enjoy every food you ever wanted. I'm sure there's plenty of food there. Food's good. But the joy of heaven, the joy of eternity, is to be in fellowship and union with our Creator, to be with our Savior, because He is preparing a place for us that we will be able to dwell in eternity with Him. That is the joy of salvation. And that is a message that, like these has been saying, like Tyson's been saying, like we've been saying for, the, for years, but especially in the last month, this gospel, this message is for everybody, that there is a chance, that there's an opportunity to be with your creator, your good and faithful creator. And I know, uh, especially in Memorial Day, and especially uh, after a week uh, where we witnessed tragedy and had funerals here at the church, and of course the shooting in Texas and other things, this world is full of grief and full of suffering and loss. And I uh, was kind of led to this prayer in this book, um, as someone had written, I was going to read a portion of it. It says this, Now shape me, Lord, even through this ache and sorrow, into one who does not let my pain harden into hate, but one who instead is made more tender over time. Convince me of your promise that my loss will be eternally restored. And so let me in time grow still more fearless in my love, O Christ. Vengeance and justice are in your hands, not ours. And even when our human systems get it wrong, still your eternal judgments will be right. So 
So do not let the darkness of this world overshadow the light of your love in me. Now make your redeeming mercies manifest, O Christ. Take this evil, this great evil, and by the unseen movements of your spirit, subvert that act of violence, shaping as a playwright crafts a scene, taking one character's ill intent and weaving even that back into a grander narrative display of beauty, grace, and restoration. O Holy Spirit, hover over now the chaos of this broken world, this broken situation in my broken heart. And from them call forth new mercies and new hope, that from fields seeded with mortal sorrows, let me one day reap a harvest of immortal joys. And from the stony soil of human hatreds, let fountains of divine love burst forth. And let streams of gladness run and pool, and let shoots of verdant mercy root and bloom. And over all this dark and weary land, let your eternal glories rise, radiant as a dawning sun dispelling a black and tragic night. And from this very heart of death, O oh God, call forth new and everlasting life. Amen. The joy of the gospel is that the things that we suffer through, our burdens are restored. That's the truth of Christ's death, that even though he died, he was resurrected. And so I don't grieve in Christ's death the same way, but I rejoice in the new life promised by his resurrection. And that's what communion is for, to remember, of course, the death but of course, to boast only in the resurrection of Jesus, to boast in Christ's life and our life with him, and to boast in hope by nothing we've done, but everything that Christ has done. So let's prepare the elements together. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, and he said, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after giving thanks, he took the wine and said, this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, you are our hope and our promise. May we be uh, walking redemption. May your spirit in us be transformative truth. That you have brought new life that your gospel transforms sorrow into joy and death into life, grief into everlasting love. Lord, we do love you. We pray that this is the message we are compelled to share. We pray for your spirit to urge us on. Let your church live and thrive and grow. We love you and it's in your glorious name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and we'll sing together one verse one more time before we head out. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know is true he satisfies my longings as nothing else can do I love to tell the story twill be my theme and glory to tell the old old story Amen. Go and tell the story. Go in peace.